Um, this on Wednesday night it was a powerful, powerful night. Uh, we had night of prayer on, which is our th- uh, fourth Wednesday of the month. But just uh, every chair in here was prayed for, for family members, for businesses, for it was just powerful. Uh, there's life in this house. You can say it again. There's life in this house, and there's life in your house. Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Amen. And so if you got Jesus, you got life, and there's more life to be had in your house. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're in a series called Whole Family. I believe God wants whole families. He wants the whole family to be whole, to have nothing missing, nothing lacking, to just be complete. And uh, we actually, in, within this series um, of Whole Family, we, we started on something a couple weeks ago called The Thief. And the thief of comparison, and this is one of those things that gets into our house sometimes. Uh, we lock the doors at night, but this is the one of the things that we kind of put before our eyes. Our devices are famous for just telling us what we don't have, what we can't do, and you know all of these kind of things. And so we kind of hit on that a little bit, and then uh, it kind of morphed into um, just the the, the uh, last week's message, which I thought I'd get to two things. Uh, ended up only getting to one, um, and and we talked about guarding our heart. And so sometimes, you know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, guard your heart uh, because out of that place, everything flows. And we talked about two things. What, what could, when you guard your heart, sometimes um, you guard, it's like capture the flag. How many of you ever played capture the flag? You're guarding what you already have. But then there's also the guarding of the heart, which you would guard so nothing can get in, right? So you put the lid on. Uh, maybe the, the, the bowl of fruit at the, at tonight, right? So that the flies don't get in, right? So we, we put, so there's a guard that both for, to, to, that would keep us from uh, allowing something to be stolen or uh, a guard from a lot that would keep that we should have over our heart so that the wrong things don't get in. Yeah. And so last week we said, what is the one thing that often comes out of our heart? And we get, we forget. We forget the goodness of God, and we looked a little bit just how, um, how it's so easy it is uh, to move into a place, and we looked in Deuteronomy, where you, you know, can, we can move into a, a land that just God provided. We can you know, get married to the, the woman of our dreams, and then 15 years later, or five years later, or, or next week, or whatever, after the honeymoon, we forget, like, we prayed for this, and God answered our prayer. And we can forget that we prayed, we got some, we got a, a, a two terrible twos we hear, or, or there's not sleeping at night and they're colicky and you prayed for this. Okay, you can have, a, uh, you can be dealing with a late night teenage situation. You, you prayed for this. And we for, can forget the goodness of God and what now comes out of our mouth is complaining and discontentment and gripe and all of these kind of things. And, and as I be, move into the complaining and I forget to be thankful, I forget all the things that God has done for me, then what happens is I become discontent, disenchanted with who I have around me. I can be disenchanted with my kids and be like, well, why can't you be more like them? Or, or God forbid that we, th- we say that, but that, there's thoughts. It's like, well, you know, at least his wife doesn't chew, da, da, da. You don't know anything. Uh, the, the grass is green. It's probably because it's green. <laughs> er. All right, so today we're going to, uh, so, we, so we're going to talk really about guarding our heart. I want you to turn there because I want you to see this. So guarding the heart, guarding the home starts with guarding the heart, okay? We're talking, this is again part two of guarding, uh, of guarding our home. So guarding the home starts with guarding your heart. Proverbs 4, 20 through 24 says this, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Uh, and so the, I, I love uh, writing in my Bible, like a circle, you, my words. Why? Because the, his words, he says, do not let them out of your sight, but keep them within your heart. So we know that, again, we're to guard our heart because words get in there. And this is one of the things that we're, what we're really talking about is what words are getting in our heart and what words are, in a sense, being stolen from our heart. Our heart holds words. So he says, guard that, keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. So the words you hold in your heart can affect your body? Yeah. They can affect your home? You bet. They can affect the car ride to church, and they can affect the car ride to go get ice cream. It was supposed to have fun. 
You're going to like it. We, you ever, have you ever tried so hard to do something fun and right, and somehow some words get in, some cross, and all of a sudden you're just, it turn, just it, I'm turning around. Who cares? You know, just whatever. And it's just because words got in to our heart. They affect our whole body. It says, above all else, guard, uh, be vigilant, be watchful, uh, for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Keep your mouth free from perversity and keep corrupt talk far from your lips. It's interesting that that piece right there follows the guard. Our mouths are truly the weapon that we guard with. Our, our, how many of you know if... if uh, sometimes, you know, when you're uh, young boys or you're wrestling or you're just having fun, um, I don't know, I'll just give you an example, maybe something that has happened at, at my house with me as a dad. Um, maybe there would be something like a, a piece of watermelon on the table, right? And that maybe one of my boys really wants to grab it. And I want them to have it, but maybe I have a stick and I, or something, and I'm like, come on, go ahead and have it. And what happens is they don't want to reach their hand there because I'm going to whack it, you know, or just messing with, messing around, you know, just kind of like, because I got something in my hand. I got something that I can read, you know, or I got maybe, yeah, here's right there. I got the wet towel. Come on. Yeah, you can have it. You come, come get it, buddy. Yeah, right there. Come on. And, and it, it keeps them at bay. It, it, I got a weapon. I got a wet towel. I got a stick. I got, I got something. Uh, one of my boys might say, I'll have a booger in his hand and be like, come on, come get it. Come to, you know, and he'll, it's a weapon. It's something that, that he's got. And, and the, you understand what I'm trying to say? Have you ever done that? Have you ever been around kids? Have you ever just, it, they got something that keeps you from going. You, it's not, well, I'm not, it's not, it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't know how we got on that. But uh, the Bible tells us that God's words are spirit and life. They're spirit and life. And so, and, and even um, when we talk about words, it, it, they're, they're spirit, they're breath. So when, when things are going on and when things get into our heart, it, it's more than just affecting me here. It's affecting us here. It affects the atmosphere. You ever see, had an argument, you walk into a room, or you weren't there, but you walk into a room and the atmosphere, you could cut the tension with a knife? It affects the atmosphere. So we're going we're gonna to talk about just even having the right atmosphere at our home, the air of locality. Here's the definition of Webster's for atmosphere. It's the air of a locality. The atmosphere, that area, the atmosphere here in Arkansas, it's like heavy you know, like really yesterday, humid, hot, but yet humid. Uh, another definition is a surrounding influence or environment. So what is surrounding our homes? What is surrounding our marriage? What is surrounding our children? Or what are our children growing up in? How are, how are they learning to navigate some things? And I ultimately want to get to this morning is, um, is are our homes filled with forgiveness? Because there's some, sometimes our hearts hold things that they're not meant to hold. And can I say it this way? Um, it's, not just, it's not just forgiveness for others. It's also forgiveness for yourself. If you ever make a mistake, sometimes we hold other people to a higher, higher place because we hold ourselves to such a high place. And that's because we don't hold the blood of Christ. We don't remember how high it paid a price. And how value, how precious the blood of Christ was and is. And so we're going we're gonna to get there this morning, but um, you, just stay with me here. So again, uh, what gets taken out, um, be careful don't, that you don't forget the Lord. And we're going to go through a few notes. God's goodness, thankfulness leads to contentment. First Corinth, or First Timothy 6.6, 6. great gain. How do you get that? Contentment, thankfulness, Right? And then we, we looked at this, uh, just again, just a little review on marriage. Um, we talked about the marriage bed for a moment. You know, it was interesting uh, when I was going over these again, the Lord like, bring it up again. This is the third time I'm bringing up the marriage bed in four weeks. About just, uh, so here's the thing. If you don't like hearing it, it's for you. 
I, you know, if it, it, some people are like, yeah, we're cool. You know, like the shoe fits, it didn't fit. So I'm not, I'm just like, a I don't whoop. But what goes on, or what you allow in your marriage bed is hugely important. Don't bring the world into your marriage bed unless you want the world to devour your marriage. That's right. Okay, that's it. And it says this in Hebrews chapter 13, 4 through 6, marriage should be honored by all and marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexual immoral. And then it goes on to say this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Isn't this interesting? Just for a moment. But being content with your spouse will, can, is key to keeping your marriage bed pure. Oh, you're looking for the next new thing? Can I tell you the greatest thing? Thankful. Because let me tell you, lust is never satisfied. This is how people get to the pedophilia, or I don't even know how you can get there, but uh, where, where, where little kids, and it's, it's absolutely crazy. It's because lust is never satisfied. And so if you don't get a handle on your lust, you will destroy your marriage. We're going to move on from that. We're going to go to today's message. So what's getting in? What's getting in? You know, one of the things that can get in really easy is accusation. So we're going to talk about forgiveness in the home, forgiveness, and we're going to talk about having a culture, an atmosphere, a locality, an environment of your home where we're quick to forgive and not to hold over somebody's head a suffered wrong. You know, some of us, well, let's keep going here. So let's look here. Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 6 uh, and we, this was our base scripture for last week. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil's schemes. I want to I pause for a moment and just talk about the devil. We know yeah, you've heard me talk about devil, diabolo. In other words, uh, diameter, well thought through. A thought that's thrown at you and me. And it's so well thought through that it sits to one side to the other. But let's just talk about Satan versus devil. Okay, for just a moment. This is really important when you read your Bible. When you read your Bible and you see the word devil, the word devil is speaking not just of your enemy, but how your enemy works. When you see the word Satan, your adversary, adversary, enemy, the devil. So where you see Satan, Satan just means ad, is adversary. Satan is your enemy. He could be working this way. He could be working that way. But where you see Satan... Or where you see, excuse me, devil, you're going to see this is how he works. And he works as one that throws a thought, but ultimately it's about this slander. To, 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 to break up or to, to cut down, to bring a divide between something that was to bring you life. We don't realize this, all, but this is what he's, uh, it's a slander, it's a slash, it's a cut. It's it, it, any time that there is the enemy or the devil, not just the enemy Satan, but the devil, he is talking, he is slandering, he is cutting down and trying to cut and have a, a between uh, that which is to bring you life, to break it, to cut the fellowship. So he says this, he said, finally be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's scheming, he's planning to get a divide, to get something that, that would make so much sense to you, well thought through, that would cause a divide and cause you to be divided from the thing and the people that are to, in your family that is God had set to bring life to you. To grow you, to strengthen you, to shape you. To I hate when they do this. Yeah, because you got to grow in that. Yeah. Right? Like the things we're good at, we don't really hate. It's the things that we struggle with that we hate. But yet somehow some, God puts people in our lives that kind of remind us maybe of some things that we need to exercise. Yeah. All right? He says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. And we were just talking about this. If we're going to guard our home, it's not just locking the front door. It's recognizing that the enemy's coming with words, and he's coming to slander. Slander. All right? The atmosphere of a home starts with the thoughts that we think. Isn't that true? The atmosphere of your home. Think about this for a moment. You're not going to be able to make your payment on the house. Think about that for a little while. 
maybe a couple days. Maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Think about how you don't have enough for the end of the month. And now you tell me what Saturday looks like when you're supposed to be going out and taking your kid to soccer. Tell me how that soccer morning goes. And someone says, hey, uh, afterwards we're going to grab an ice cream at Brahms. Tell me how that car ride from soccer to Brahms goes with your family because of what you've been thinking on and the enemy has made sure you saw it on every side and you're supposed to go to Brahms? We don't even have... Tell me how it goes. It matters. It matters what words are filling our hearts. It matters. The, the, the thoughts I think determine the atmosphere of my home. Can you... He, she always leaves. There they are again. His clothes are on the floor. There, <laughs> gotta laugh. There they are again. Clothes are on the floor. We'll just see next time if he's gonna leave his clothes on the floor. What do you think? I'm his mom, you know? In the marriage, clothes are on the floor. Clothes are on the floor. Left the toilet seat up. I'm, I am just done. It's like, the trash is full. Hey, hun. What do you mean, hey, hun? No, no, we're not. <laughs> the thoughts you think, uh, it matters. It matters. matters. So we, we said this, that Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 26 to 27. Let's, let's look there real quick. It says, be angry and yet don't sin. And do not let the sun uh, set upon your anger. And do not give the devil a foothold. So how the devil, again, the slander. Do not give the slander a place to operate from. In this word, we talked about this last week, about topos. It's, a, it's like the word where we get topographical map. It, it designates places and lines of, or, like, of elevation. The, it, this is, simply says this, that it designates places. So the devil would love to, um, I don't know, maybe destroy or operate in, in the area of my, money. He'd love to operate in the area of marriage. He'd love to operate in the area of relationships, employment, children. He operates in these places. He wants to get a foothold on, in every area of your and my life. Okay? So he says, but do not be angry, or be angry and do not sin, and don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. And we said this last week, that conflict points often are our entry points. So this is helpful for marriage. Where did the devil get in? Where did he get in? Go back. Just kind of whoop, 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 whoop. Where was the conflict? Where was the argument? Where was, well, you didn't get what you wanted, or I told him to get me a red one, and he bought a stinking blue one, and I don't, he knows I don't like blue. Or, or uh, maybe, maybe, guys, you ordered... Uh, uh, wanted your wife to bring you lunch, right? And so you're like, hey, get me two double cheeseburgers, but not the, not the quarter pound double stack mini ones, like give me the Dave singles, the big ones, right? And so then you're like, I don't need fries, I don't need that, I just want that, I want to hit that and go. And then what comes is uh, these, you know, like the little dollar menu double stacks. This just happened actually. <laughs> Yesterday. And in that moment, I was like, I told you, I didn't tell her this. I told you on the phone not to get me the double stacks. I want the Dave single. Get on the app and get the big one because I want the big one. I'll buy one big one and I'll get one free. I said this. This is going on in my head as I see the, my boys. They, get, they each have the biggie bag. The nuggets, the fries, the sandwich, the frosty, the drink. And she, she my wife goes, you know, I, I always thought these were bigger. But she said, this is what she said. They, and I was just like, oh, no problem. But that moment, how many of you know, don't mess with my food, okay? That moment was a moment that I had a choice to make. And had I said I, I told you, I said, did you not hear? Like you had one job, right? 
That would have been a point of conflict. And even if I didn't say anything, if, if because I ground on that and I held that, instead of being thankful, that moment could have led to another moment, to another moment. It's the points of conflict that are the points of entry. When you talk to your kids and you say, hey, where were you? And they hear it as, you don't trust me. Then they might think, then from that point, boom, 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 boom. And, and, and then from that point, he says, be angry, but do not sin and do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't give him a place to begin to build a case. And don't let him have a place where he, where he starts counting. He just starts counting. This is what happens in our lives. So the conflict points, let's go back. Let's just go back. Where, where did the enemy get in? Where, where could, you know, we think about this in the, in the winter as it gets close to winter and you see that mouse running by. You go, where's it getting in? We, 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 we don't want certain pests in our home, but we allow them so many times in our heart and we just, they let them go. Because guess what? Nobody knows what's going on in your heart except when it finally comes out. How did they have an affair? Well, that's been happening for a while. It didn't just happen. The, the, the affair mouse is going whoop, 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 whoop. In this door, out this door, secret places. All right. Hmm. So here's what he's, he, he, let me just write down something that I wrote about this verse. Excess of wrath is forbidden by the Lord. Excess of wrath is forbidden by the Lord because it often gives opportunity to the enemy who desires to break up the unity or to set at odds. The Lord says, excess of wrath, where you just lose it, that's not okay. Because when you just lose it, what you do is you open the door wide open for the enemy to break unity, break the connection of life flow in that house. So can I just tell on me? When I grew up, I don't remember. Uh, I always thought it was important to apologize for when you missed it. Okay, But sometimes when you miss it and you ha are given to and you believe you should apologize for your wrong... Sometimes you're just like, I'll just apologize for that. You know, I'll just apologize for being this way. You don't think of that way, but it gets over into that. If you couldn't apologize and make right what was wrong, then you might maybe attend to what's right a little bit more intently. But if you can just make it right and apologize and go back and pick up the pieces and say, oh, you're supposed to forgive, right? Right? You might not steward somebody else's heart the way you should. Oh, well, God forgave us. You should forgive. Yeah. And he also didn't act like a... Well, moving on. So, how many of you know the devil always releases well-thought-through arguments? He does, doesn't he? How do you know if the devil's been talking? It's well thought through. You've been chewing. You've thought it through. You've thought it through. Is it going over and over and over and over? And it's not bringing peace. It's not bringing Galatians 5, 22 or through, 20, through 23. Into your, the fruits of the Spirit. The devil's talking. He's in the home. He's in the heart. He's in the mind. He's, he's kick him out. We're going to get to their how, just how to kick him out. All right. First Timothy chapter 3, 10 through 12. He says this. Additionally, they must first be tested. So again, I want to just hit up uh, just how slander or the devil gets into our home. So when you look in, in, your, in your Bible and you look up different words, maybe you'll see the word translated devil in the Greek. You see devil, 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 slander. So the word, the word devil is uh, diablos is used as devil, the one who works this way. But sometimes it talks about our wives. Look at here. There's a couple of This is not just wives. Okay. This is not just wives, this is people, but I just want you to see this. These are two places in, 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 that I've had spent uh, quite a bit of time in the last year, a year and a half, uh, about deacons or elders of the church and the qualifications of, of who 
could, could lead the church and, and help shepherd the flock among you. It has these qualifications, and then it says, and their wives have to be this way. So it's not just one or the other. It's the whole house and the spouse. Look what it says. It says, they must, so in this... Uh, yeah, so they must first be tested, and, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. So there was all these qualifications above, and then it goes in to the next, and it says, In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers. So this is the NIV, malicious talkers. Uh, New, New Living, King James says, slanderers. You know that word right there, malicious talkers? They can't be the devil. That's what it says. Like if you were to look, it's the, uh, they, they have to be worthy of respect, not Diablos, not the devil. So you, you don't want uh, to have a deacon who has a wife that's the devil. Well, how do you know that they're the devil? Well, they don't, they're not the devil. It's just talking that they operate in such a way where they have malicious talk, slanderous talk. How do you know if the devil is in your home? Tell me about what your husband's not or your wife's not. Tell me about what your kids are not. Tell me about the devil's right there. The devil's working, and he's using you and me to do it. So you see it here. Go ahead and put up Titus 2. This is uh, 2 verse 3. This is the same thing. I don't want to take tons of time here. I just want you and I to see the word devil it speaks of how the, our enemy, Satan, works. He slanders. He cuts down. He accuses. And this gets in our home oftentimes, and we're unaware that we're partnering with him, and, and we're, we lock the doors at night, but he's all up in our midst, and the atmosphere of our home is filled with accusations, accusations all the time, and we don't know, we can't ever break free and live in the way that we're supposed to with the love of God. Because of holding to account, constantly holding to account. Likewise, teach the older women, don't get drunk. Okay? To live be, oh, this is, I'll say it on this one. Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live and not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. So, all you old lady, older ladies, quit, you know, lay off the. You know, hey, listen, if you had to put up with him, I get it, right? No, no just kidding. But, he said, don't get addicted to wine. But before that, it says, don't be a slanderer or, or don't be the devil. Can you, can you th think about this? Are you being the devil? This is a good, say, am I, am I being the devil today? Like asking yourself, am I, am I, because remember Judas? He said, you're of your father or, you know, he said, he said, he said it this way. It said, I think this is uh, Luke 8, maybe, or Matthew 8. But it said, I think it's Luke 8. It says that, and yet one of you is the devil. Jesus says, and yet one of you is the devil. And he's talking about Judas. And yet one of you is the devil. Could you think that Judas sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver without having first talked about and cut down Jesus' decision about whether it was the women, the woman that had, had anointed him, or the way that Jesus was using his money, he was slandering, he was cutting down, can I say it this way, talking about Jesus, talking about Jesus to the disciples, talking about Jesus, because you can do that with your brother about mom and dad, right? You can do that with your sisters about mom and dad and how mom and dad never, right? You can do that with your spouse, you can do that with your coworker about your spouse, you can do... You think he was maybe doing that? Well, he made a deal for 30 pieces of silver. He might have been talking to the Sanhedrin. He might have been talking to the Pharisees. He might have been double dipping on the side for quite a while. Yeah, because one of you is the devil. He's, say, he's saying this, that one of you is a slanderer here. That's where betrayal comes. Slander. You want... You say you love this, you say you love that person, you say you love that friend, you say that you're like this, but yet you talk about them, yet you cut and you slander them and you belittle them and you talk about what they did wrong and what they, there is no covering, but there is a lot of counting. So let's talk about that for a moment. Let's, well, here, let's go here first. So uh, 
uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captive to the obedience of Christ. We have to recognize that what you and I are fighting and the way that we're fighting is we're fighting against, and not just natural things, but against those thoughts. The only power the enemy has in your and my life, in your marriage, in your family, is the power of agreement with him. Where you and I agree, we have, to, we have to agree with the enemy. This is why he formulates things so well thought through, to get your agreement so he can have authority. Where he doesn't have your agreement, where the devil doesn't have your agreement, where you refuse to slander and you refuse to cut down, he doesn't have your agreement and he doesn't have authority in that house and in that family. But you want to give authority to, to the devil in your house, in your family? You want to give authority to the devil in your church? You want to give the authority to the devil in your workplace? Just start being the devil. It's like the devil's running loose in here. Yeah, he is. What's his name? I don't know. Peter? I don't know. John? I don't know. Could it be, could it be Sam? Could it be, could it be Lance? Oh, Trenton. Oh, Levi. Hey, devil. Like, no, this is, how do we know? It, it, it could happen. It could happen to Nate. Yeah. Oh, Nate. Devil. Devil, it's like he's running loose in here. We can't figure out where he's at. Yeah, he's right there. You're looking at him, hon. The devil. He's loose. He's talking. He's cutting. He's slandering. Let's close the door on that. Let's close the door on the slander and the cutting and the accusation. It says this in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. And this is the, we read this the love chapter, but this is a place that we, we, we got to see what it looks like because we, we're so not that, just naturally. Our flesh is not that. Inside, the love of God is shed abroad. But that means we're going to have to yield that way and not look out this way. It says, do not become, uh, do not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its, love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked, nor does it take into account a wrong suffered. So how much of the atmosphere of your home, I'll tell you, the devil's running loose. We're talking about protecting the home. If your house is filled with counting, how much of your atmosphere or the atmosphere of your house is filled with counting? Do you have a running list? Maybe you have a notes in your phone of all the bad things your dad has ever said. Maybe. Just kidding. We have some funny sayings that dad has said, some good, some not so good. Um, but if you keep a running list, and that's not a, a bad thing, uh, but if you're keeping a running list of, of what is going on, maybe, maybe you're good at accounting. You know, we teach people to go to school for that, don't we? To go to school to be an accountant. Let's, let's talk about this. Um, have, have you made the deposit into the account? You know, have you ever talked about that? What, what's being deposited? What deposits are going into the account? You ever talk to your spouse about, hey, did you make that deposit so we can write that check? Listen, what depo what's being deposited in your heart? What's being deposited in my heart? Has the enemy made a deposit lately? I, I don't know. Here's the deal. The account is the place the devil works from. I'm going to say that again. The account, you know, the account is the place that the devil works from. It's the stronghold in our minds. It's where you and I count. It's that place, the account, the enemy can bring destruction to your family and break a divide between you and your kids because there's counting about how they always, or there's counting where they're counting what dad always does or what they're counting. Are you a saver? You know, this is, we're, we're talking about the account. Anybody got the account? You a saver, you know? Just let it build up. Huh? Who in here is a saver? No, no show of hands. How many of you have a spouse that's a saver? Okay, that no show of hands. That was wise. What, what, what is a saver? You know, let it build up. You know, the compound interest, that's where it really pays. You know, let it, just let it build up, compound. Leave it in there a while. Just let it stew. Let it sit there. And then let it hit the fan. The account. You know, we, people go to school for accounting, yet we need to teach or be taught to keep a clear ledger. 
you. Don't we have to be taught right here? Like, this is what we're talking about. What's the ledger of your heart say? What's the ledger of my heart say? This is something that only you and the Lord, because everything starts with the seed. Everything starts with the thought. The choices we make are because of the voices that we hear. So let's go here real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, or 2, verse 10 through 11. It says this, um, For if you forgive anyone, I also will forgive him. If you have forgiven anything, I have forgiven in the presence of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan not, should not outwit us. So we're talking about we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, or we're, we're, we're talking about don't let the, the enemy scheme in. We were looking at that. He'd love to get a hold in our lives. So look at this here. In order that Satan might not outwit us, how does he outwit us? out with us when we don't forgive the verse right before so we are not unaware of his schemes he outwits us we don't have to be unaware of our of of satan's schemes we have to just if we're not unaware and he's not going to outwit us we're going to have to be good at forgiving we're going to have to be really good at forgiving when i when i grew up I, i i dated my wife since middle school um and this this things had changed in me drastically in the last 20 years, but I would say in the first two and a half years of our liking one another, all the way, maybe, maybe even first four years, if something happened, like maybe she didn't t- stop by my locker in the hallway, okay, big deal. Middle school, late middle school, early high school drama, she was busy, she didn't get her stuff done to where this is their only time to see each other in between class, right? Um, and so something happened, or maybe she was, seemed to me that she was flirting with another guy or whatever. And I got upset. That might last a little while. I might, in a sense, make her pay. However I could make her pay. You know, a couple days. And she would, you know what she would say? She would cry. She would apologize. And I would try to make her feel bad. Oh, I know, I'm a dirtbag. Probably like a lot of you. When somebody did something wrong to you and you want to make them pay. But something happened where, in my life where, where she extended forgiveness where I, I didn't forgive easily. I, I, I held on to things long. But as I watch and as I experience somebody loving me without holding, and, and just, it changed me. And it changed me to where I, I, I really believe I'm one of the quick, I don't know, I'm not going to compare myself among myself. I'm very quick to forgive or not count those things wrong anymore. Something changed because of the love of God was shown towards me. Now I could do that back. I could yield to that. And that's what's going on in, 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 our, in our home. Like if someone comes and lives with us for a little while, like, listen, you might miss, I might miss it, you might miss it. When we talk and we forgive, that's it. Never to be brought up again. The love of God. Let's be good at forgiving. Yeah. Forgiving beforehand. You know, we got to talk about this because of this, but man, we're moving on. We're moving on. We're, we're moving on. Look at this here. Second Corinthians 10. Again, we, we just went here. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pull down strongholds. So we cast down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If you and I are going to keep and protect our home, we're going to have to learn to cast down those thoughts. That's how you forgive. You have to learn to cast down the thoughts. We're not saying that, oh, everything is perfect. No, we're saying that was wrong. That hurt, but I'm taking that, and I'm saying I'm choosing to forgive, and all these thoughts that are coming, I'm going to choose, and I'm going to bring it to the obedience of, of Christ. Uh, you're, you, maybe you're like me sometimes where you've struggled forgiving. you struggled, uh, but you're listening to those words. You're listening to those words. If you listen to the wrong words, it, you, you're going you're to kill what you love. Proverbs 18, 21, and we're going to get right back to uh, that, that, that verse here where we're talking about taking down, taking that thought, taking that thought captive. But Proverbs 18, 21, this is the message, words kill, words give life. They either poison, they're either poison, they're either poison or fruit you choose. W- words kill, words give life. They're either poison or they're fruit you choose. 
So the words you and I listen to, we're either feeding on fruit or we're poisoning, and we're poisoning the water among us. And so, so many times, what happens is, is we listen to this word, we listen to this thought, and we, it's the slander, it's the accuser, and this is how he speaks. And these are five ways the enemy accuses, and he talks to you, or to me rather, first, the first number one way that the enemy accuses in your marriage, he talks to me about you. The enemy's talking, he's talking to me about my spouse. He's talking to me about my children. He's talking to me about my pastor. He's talking to me about my coworker. He's talking to me. This is the number, this is the first way. He starts talking to you about them. The next way he starts to talk to you about you. You ever, you ever have that happen? Or he, or excuse me, you to me. Like, like in other words, your spouse is uh, hearing about you. You know, they, so your mind is going, well, they're thinking this about me. So you were once thinking just about them and all that they did wrong. Now you're tied up in this trap about what they're thinking about you. And they're not even thinking about you. The accuser's talking to you about what they're thinking about you. And you're, he's making up all kinds of stories of why they looked at you that way. They're, he's making up all kinds of stories about why she only got you the quarter pound double stacks. Oh, yeah, yeah. All kinds of stories. The accuser. So I, I'm thinking about her. Now I'm thinking about what she's thinking about me. It's so messed up. It's such a torment. And it's so well thought through. And it's like your head's just like in the atmosphere of your home and the atmosphere of your heart. It's changing and it's not going the right direction. And, and you're wondering why things keep dying. And you want what's so, you want what's right. But yet you're willing to allow this to stay there. Then he begins to accuse me to myself. Well, you shouldn't have done that. You lost it. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. I'm too late now. I'm just mad at myself. I'm mad that I got mad. And now I'm mad that I got mad that I got mad. And I'm mad that I'm still mad that I'm mad about getting mad. I shouldn't have said that. I knew I shouldn't have said that. But I'm mad that I said that. And I shouldn't have said that. And I knew better that I shouldn't have. And I, I, I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. But I, all I know is I don't know how to get out of this because I'm angry. And I missed it. And, I, and they're not going to forgive me because I know what they're thinking right now. And really what they're thinking is, I hate seeing them tormented like this. <laughs> the enemy's working. The enemy's working. And you know how else he, the enemy likes to... The, to accuse, he likes to accuse God to me. So is the accuser present in the atmosphere of your home? Well, you would have thought God would have. This is how the you would have thought God would have made a way so where we didn't lose the house. You would have thought God would have done something. You would have thought God would have done something. You thought God. You would have thought, and then it goes the other way like this, where me to God. So. The enemy, he's talking and telling me to God and all of my shortcomings to God and all of these things to God and all these things to God. And again, we're going back to we don't wrestle against these natural things. And the way that we wrestle, it's not a natural way. The weapons of our warfare, are, they're, not, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull down strongholds. So these are, these are strongholds, the strongholds of the thought that, that are well formulated, that where the enemy fights, and he fights against you and me, where, where our own desires, our own weaknesses, where he could get in, there's a place of stronghold. What do I do? How do I really wrestle against that? How do I walk in forgiveness? How do I take authority? How do I cast the devil out? How do I lock the door? This is a really simple way. And so many times we hear, especially in church, we hear about the blood of Jesus and I plead the blood. What do you hear when you hear plead the blood? Somebody tell me, I plead the blood of Jesus. What do we hear? Somebody give me a word. When I say I plead the blood of Jesus over my family, what am I saying? Protection. The primary, the primary, we, we, we say that because we look at the blood over the door, right? And the Passover. I plead the blood that death would pass over my family. But can I tell you when the blood was applied? It wasn't so that the death would pass over. That was the effect of the declaration that there, that's a righteous home. The blood declared mine and righteousness. These are mine 
my, my ones, my righteous ones. And so death could not operate there. For the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is through Jesus Christ is this. So there's a gift of righteousness that allowed, because the wages of sin is death. If, 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 if you're righteous, sin or death can't be there. If righteousness reigns there, death has no right there. So now let's talk about the blood of Jesus. Let's look at this, where, uh, where when, we, when we declare the blood of Jesus over, it says this. I'm going to jump I'm jumped way too far ahead here. We'll hit there and we'll go back. But Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 through 11. I heard a loud voice shouting across heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ. For the accuser of our, of our brothers, or Satan, nope, the devil, yeah, it's the same one, but how he works, the accuser. The accuser, he's been thrown down. He's been cast out. He's been kicked out of the house. How's that? He's been moved on from the Schlegel family. He no longer lives and dwells in the Parker house. He's been moved out. How? Because they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testament. So here's what I want to talk about to this morning and how do we, you and I don't wrestle naturally, carnal, but we remember the blood of Jesus and what it did for you and me so that I can do something like that to somebody else. I can't love you unless I know how much I'm loved. Simple as that. We have to remember the blood of Christ. We have to remember that my sins were like scarlet. Do you remember that? When, let, let's, let's talk about how they, were ta- how they talked to you. Let's, let's remember all of these things, but let's put it up to Isaiah 118 and remember, come now, let us reason together. While we're reasoning about how they should have and what they didn't do, let's reason this right here. Um, Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as sin. Yeah, but we're not talking about my sins. We're, we're talking about how they missed it here. And, and when we get this figured out here, no, no. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Because you're reasoning with the devil here. But let us reason. Let's get, back. Let's get God involved with, what, with the fight here. Let's reason the blood. So though my sins were like scarlet, they're now white as... Okay, yeah, I don't want to talk about my sins. We're talking about their sins. No, let's th- talk about your sins for a moment. Let's, in the moment of talking, let's talk about your and my sins. And let's talk about how they were like scarlet. But now, somehow, they're like snow. Okay, let's talk about how uh, they were crimson red, but now they're like, they're like wool. Wow. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for, just, for sins, for all of our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was, Christ suffered once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous, because that was, I guess, the, the right, that, that's Jesus, the righteous for unrighteous me, okay? To bring me, why did he do that? To bring me to God. The only reason you even have a remote right to be with the Lord is solely on the blood of Christ. So how can, how can I receive that and not let that be applied to them as well? Let's look at this next verse, Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west. Yeah, I'm going to forgive them, but I'm not going to forget them. I'm going to forgive, but I'm not going to forget. No, I'm going to just let it stay in that spot in my mind. I'm going to keep it in that savings account. You know the one that earns that long accruing interest? Compound, compound, compound. Because that's what Jesus did, right? Now, I'm not telling, telling you and I to be abused. Nowhere in the, does the Bible tell us to be abused, to be abused mentally, to be abused physically, or, or anything else for that matter. But it does tell us how we're to love others as Christ loved us. It does tell us, uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. It tells us that we're to love like Christ. How did Christ love us? By putting a patch over your sin or washing it clean? But by washing it clean and taking it off of you but storing it all up over here so he can show you on the, uh, I don't know, the slideshow of heaven about all the things that you did wrong on the day of judgment? Is that what he says? 
Because if he removed it as far as the east is from the west, if he blotted it out so he doesn't remember it no more, then how is he going to pull the file? He doesn't have a Rolodex or a filing cabinet in heaven based on your, your past sins. He washed them. He paid for them by the blood of Christ. And if you want to overcome the accuser and kick him out of your house, remember the blood. Remember the blood. Remember the sacrifice Jesus paid for you and me. I love the story about the man who, who was forgiven of much by this king and yet held this other person that owed him pennies to the, to the, to the stone and said, you're going to pay. And the king said, what? Do you not know how much you're forgiven? The atmosphere of your my home is guarded and Satan is cast out when you and I remember the blood. Remember the blood in my house. Remember how Jesus paid for you. It'll change how you and I respond, not just how you have to forgive, but how the words that was going to come out, it just, I'm sorry. Don't let the enemy keep poisoning the water or the atmosphere of your home. I'm going to say it this way. Refuse to stop judging others for their mistakes. Refuse to let, re, to stop refusing uh, to let go of old hurts and wounds. Stop. Just, just let it go. Make a decision today. To, to, today to say, you know what? Uh, the blood of Jesus washed me. It can wash them. The blood of Jesus made... Because again... the Plead, I plead the blood. I'm, I'm declaring righteousness in my home. I'm declaring they're righteous. If they're righteous, well, what, what, what do I see in wrong? So I'm declaring for me, but I, ple I plead the blood of Jesus over my children. So now I look at them that way. I look at them righteous. Then I can actually, then I can actually forgive. But if all I see is their flaws, like I, the, the blood doesn't have the power in my home that it, I declare it should. Or that it does. Right. Refuse to acknowledge what they did wrong. Oh, no, I don't know about that. Well, okay, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Does it count? Refuse to acknowledge the quarter pound double stacks. Oh, this is great. No, this is great. Thanks. Thank you so much. This is great. Oh, we have a watermelon. We'll cut that up. Something. Refuse to acknowledge it. Be thankful. Refuse to admit. You want to let the devil poison your water? Refuse to admit when you're wrong. Man, I'll tell you, that's a good way to keep the enemy in your house. When you missed it, just refuse to say anything about it. Dad, don't, don't, don't tell your kids you messed up. Don't tell your kids. You, maybe you lost it with your wife. Maybe you said some words you shouldn't have and your kids were at the table. Where does the apology need to happen? In the room? Tell me where. Where does the apology need to happen? In front of the whole family. If you're going to offend your wife in front of your children, then you're going to have to restore that relationship in front of them. This is basics right here. If, if you're going to talk and undermine down and undermine uh, something your dad said about, no, you're not going here, but yet in front of them, uh, you're going to have to uh, restore the confidence back in dad mom, and say, hey, you know what? I dishonored your dad. He told you no. And I, and I came in and said yes without asking him. I apologize. I didn't realize that he said no. And me and dad stand together and what he says goes. I didn't see something that he had already said. So I apologize. But, but the answer is no. Well, you said no, no, no. I said without knowing what dad said. Or if you did dishonor him and you knew he said no, then you Better get something right and come to get, to get into agreement and together. But that has to be a public. If you're going to disgrace publicly, you need a public apology. If you're going to yell at your coworker in front of your other coworkers, because maybe I'm the only one that's ever done that, you know what you are going to need to do? You're going to have to apologize to not just the one that you disgraced, but to all of them. Is it humble pie? Yep. Guess what? Guess what happens when you eat more humility? There's more grace. Because that's what you and I need. Grace is the answer to sin's problems. Grace is the answer to sin's problems. 
And it can only be brought about by the blood of Christ. I need grace. Where sin abounds, grace that much more. But where does grace abound? Only where the blood of Jesus is applied. That's where grace reigns. You want grace in your house? You want grace, the power of God, to meet the ten evil tendencies of today? Apply the blood. Apply the blood over your children. Not just for protection, but for their declaring righteous. How I see them. How I respond to them. So that I would walk in love. The Bible says that we love him because he loved us. You want your kids to love Jesus. You want your kids to walk and follow the Lord. You can't control them. You can't grab them. You can't manipulate them. You can't do fear. Listen, you got to love them. You love them the way that God loved them. If you're going to love them the way that God loved them, you got to see them the way he sees them. So we're not trying to do this manipulative parenting garbage. Your kids are going to mess up just like you and me did. And there was the blood for that. So you don't have to have an account. And so that they can go free. It's time that families live free because of the blood of Christ. And that we, re we, remember, we remember that. And, um, refuse to forgive others for what they did. You're going to you're gonna, if you're, you're gonna have to refuse to forgive them. Or excuse me, you're, you're going to have to choose to forgive them for what they did. And you're also going to have to choose to forgive yourself. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to close with this, forgiving yourself. This was, to me, the, maybe the crux of all of this and what I had heard in my heart. Like, all of this today was really to talk to somebody here that you're not forgiving yourself for what you said, for what you did. Um, you're not forgiving yourself. And uh, what you're saying is this. Hey, 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 let me say this. That's a strategy of the enemy to hold you. Because when you don't forgive yourself, you don't recognize the power of the blood of Jesus. If you don't recognize the power of the blood of Jesus, you cannot come to God without a condemned heart. Never. The Bible says that we come to God. If our heart condemns us, it says we can't come to God. But if our heart condemns us not, we come to God with confidence. When you don't forgive yourself, it's more, it's more than just about you not forgiving yourself. It's about you not being able to approach God with confidence because you're holding what somebody has done, you yourself has done, or somebody else has done as greater authority than the blood of Christ, and you will always struggle to come to God unless you have everything together, which is never. When you think you have everything together, and then even then the enemy reminds you of something you didn't have together, and so your prayers are hindered. You're supposed to be praying for your children. You don't want them to turn out like you did, or like you did. I hope that God that they don't do what I did when I was a kid, and you're not forgiving yourself, but you're not going to ask the Lord for that. You have no power or confidence that he's going to hear your prayer, because your faith and your trust is in your works, and this is why you don't forgive yourself, because the blood, well... That's beside the point. I did this. You have no confidence in your prayers for your children. This is what this is about. Your prayers over your house, over your marriage, over all for the enemy to devour your home. Here's what I would say. Don't forgive yourself. Let the blood of Jesus wash you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Overcome the enemy that's been in your home by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony by saying this, Lord, thank you for the blood being enough to wash my dirtiest, darkest, to wash my shortcoming, that you made a way when there was no way for me. Just let the blood be magnified in our hearts today. Let that word, the blood, be the word that is in my heart. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, Satan will be cast down. The devil will be eradicated from your home, from your marriage. Plead the blood. I plead the blood over that. Father, I thank you for the blood over my sins that washed me white as snow. I thank you for the blood. 
over my children and over their sins. Thank you for the blood. You know, when you plead the blood, death has no right there. We want to talk about protection. Let's not miss the basis, which is righteousness. Let's stand this morning. John 3, 23. And this is the commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we should love one another just as he commanded us. There are house rules. And it's right here. There's a command. It's a command for the house of God. It's a command for the Schlegel house. It's a command for the Parker house. It's a command for the Costellos and the Burroughs. It's a command. It's a command for your house. It's a command for the Sorensons. Right here. Believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. If you don't believe that Jesus came to pay the price for your sins, this is a salvation message right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Wow. That whoever would believe in him, he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He came to save us. Believe, for God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the command for the house. This is the house rules right here. Believe in Christ. Let him save your family. And then love one another as Christ has loved us. Thank you, Lord. If there's anyone here today, I don't want to close this morning. If there's anyone here that, um, man, you've been trusting your own works far too much. Um, maybe you've, maybe this is a this is the, the what I had seen in my heart. Maybe you've been trusting your own works and not the blood of Christ. And the Lord is saying. You're not like walked away from the Lord. You're trying with all your might to be close to him. You're not, it's not like, oh, I'm, this is a, okay, I'm backslidden. I'm trying to get, like, climb the hill that I can't climb. So this is a, a trust in the blood of Jesus and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross uh, prayer. And really, truly to, to honor that with the words of your mouth and kind of, in a sense, get over that hill of just try and works. And so if that's you to this morning, you just are like, I, I've been trying and I just seem like just condemnation, condemnation, condemnation of all that I haven't done, all that. I just want you to lift your hand this morning, just right where you're at. And we're going to take the words of our mouth and we're going to break over that in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your hands. Thank you for your hands. There's hands, I'm telling you. The enemy, he's been working in the home. He's been working. He's been talking to you. You'll never break free of where you agree with him. You'll never break free from there. So as long as he's got you there, you'll never climb that hill until you, you'll never break free and over that until you declare the blood of Jesus is enough for you. And so I want to lead you to this prayer. Just say this with me. Say, Father, today I stand here and I magnify the blood of Jesus, your son. The blood was enough for my sins, for my past, for my present, for my future. I trust the blood. I declare the blood over me over my life, over every sin, over every shortcoming. Thank you for washing, making me clean, white as snow, pure and holy to you. Thank you for the confidence placed in my heart by your Holy Spirit to come boldly to you to meet with you to ask of you 
my heart's desires. Plead the blood. I declare the blood. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Pray over our families uh, before we go and are dismissed this morning. We're going to plead the blood of Jesus over our families over some past things, over some hurts, over some relationships. How many of you know outside things can get into the inside things? There's maybe some relationships that need the blood applied. There's maybe whatever it might be, maybe within the spouse, maybe with the kids. But we're going to just take a moment before we go, and we're going to actually put into practice the word, and we're going to eradicate Satan from our house. Amen? And so, Father, right now, we, just, we, we, we take a moment... Uh, to not wrestle naturally or carnally, but we uh, take captive the stronghold, the, the argument that has been made uh, over and over to us, the, uh, the, the fiery darts uh, about somebody else, and today we apply the blood of Jesus there. We plead the blood of Jesus over, over those past wrongs, over the mistakes, uh, or even what would be told to us that was intentional. We plead the blood of Jesus there, and we thank you that we would see uh, the power of the blood of Christ in our homes. We declare righteousness. We declare uh, eyes that see as you see, so that we could love and love by faith. We choose today to not to count. Where we've been counting, we empty the account this morning. We just declare the account bankrupt, emptied because of the love of God. Because of the blood of Jesus, we, we bankrupt that account. That, and Father, thank you for a, just a healing and a washing and a, even a, the memories of the past, just healing those places. No, no scars. You are restoring God. A, a creative God. Thank you for restoring uh, father-son relationships where there was a hurt and a schism and the wrong words said. Thank you for restoring marriages this morning where, where there was betrayal. Father, I thank you for restoring the same way when it is when we come back to you when we've left you, that there's just as a unnoticed, just a love. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit, not just the work of men. We thank you for whole families. Whole families. And we say, my family is whole in Jesus' name. Because of the blood of Jesus, my family is whole. My marriage is whole. And I say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, as we're dismissed, before we go to the turtle race, um, if you need healing in your body um, or prayer and agreement for anything, we'd love to pray with you up here afterwards. Otherwise, uh, we will see you tonight at the Memorial Day picnic. Don't forget your turtles. See you at 6.